Fiat's back on form with this characterful 500X small crossover model. It's bigger than it looks and there's lots of choice when it comes to engines, drive systems, transmissions and a whole stack of personalization options. If you're looking for a surefire conversation starter, you can't do a lot better. These days, every mainstream brand needs a small, trendy crossover. And here's Fiat's take on the Duke genre, the fashionable 500X. It's easy to see what the Italian brand is trying to do here. Ever since BMW broadened the appeal of its modern-day Mini by spinning from it a whole range of more versatile body styles, Fiat has had its eye on doing exactly the same thing with the iconic little 500 model. From that moment that the new era model was announced in 2007, plans were made to widen its market reach. Hence the launch of a 500C convertible in 2009, a 500L small MPV in 2012, the seven-seat 500 MPW in 2013, and this 500X crossover in the spring of 2015. In truth, none of these derivatives have sold very strongly, but Fiat has higher hopes for this one. First, because its perch shape has none of the awkwardness common to previous five-door 500 models. And secondly, because with this small crossover, the brand has rather belatedly entered one of the market's fastest growing segments, fueled by the success of cars like Nissan's Duke and Renault's Capture, and recently bolstered by fresh arrivals from brands like Mazda, Citroen, Honda and Jeep. That Jeep contender, the Renegade, was this Fiat's design stablemate, and under the skin, the two cars shared just about everything. Predictably, the 500X is more affordable though, priced to deliver the numbers in this sector, and engineered to build on this Italian maker's heritage of affordable, compact little all-weather runabouts. One that for more than 30 years has seen tiny Panda 4x4s frequently embarrass much larger SUVs in some of the world's toughest places. This model certainly inhabits one of the market's toughest places, with just about every mainstream brand now designing cars for its designated small crossover segment. So, will it sink or swim there? Let's find out. Inevitably, Fiat's advertising for this car is based around impossibly good-looking and fashionable people traversing snowy slopes and rocky hillsides. This, as usual, ignores the way that nearly all small crossover models are actually used. These cars are bought for the urban jungle rather than for the Serengeti. Even Fiat predicts that only 20% of 500X models will be sold with 4x4 mechanicals, and we'd be prepared to bet that the actual number will be even lower than that. Still, at least this car offers the option of all-wheel drive, a feature normally notable by its absence in this segment. If the prospect of that kind of extra traction interests you, then stay with me. I'll get to the detail in a minute. Before I do, though, it's worth pointing out that there is a third way here that, personally, I'll be tempted to choose on this class of car, an option that bridges the gap between having yourself a small front-driven crossover model that will rather embarrassingly flounder just as much as any other conventional compact car during the next snowy snap, or one with a heavy four-wheel drive system that you're unlikely to need and a price tag that you're unlikely to like. The middle ground option I'm talking about comes courtesy of a clever feature that really adds a bit of substance to the stylish appeal of this car, the drive mood selector, accessible by this rotary dial down by the gear stick and fitted to all models provided you avoid entry level trim. Like most systems of this sort, this one adjusts throttle response, steering feel and stability control system intervention, plus also gear shift timings where auto transmission has been fitted. Like other setups, it can tweak all these things to suit more spirited motoring via a sport mode. Or alternatively, it supplies an auto setting that will choose the best configuration for you. What's different here, though, is this third option you get, the mode that'll make a two-wheel drive 500X surprisingly effective when the weather turns wild or the surface turns slippery. It'll be called all-weather if you've got one of the standard cheaper models, or traction if you've stretched to one of the, uh, the more SUV-like Cross or Cross Plus 500X variants, a car like the one I've got here. Either way, 
clicking into this setting switches this Fiat into a low grip mindset with instant electronic adjustment made to suit muddy or icy conditions. On the cross derivative you also get a surprisingly effective traction plus electronic front differential system and with this in place and a decent set of winter tyres you'll find that you can get surprisingly long way when conditions turn nasty. It's a good compromise if your need of extra traction is going to be very occasional. But of course, if you happen to live or work somewhere particularly remote, then there's ultimately no substitute for the peace of mind of the kind of proper 4x4 system that comes as an option on a cross variant like the one I'm trying here. Predictably, this Fiat setup is one of those part-time ones that normally keeps you front-driven but can instantly bring the rear wheels into play via a clever rear axle disconnection system as soon as the conditions demand it. Click into the drive mood selector's traction setting and there's even a natty dashboard display that'll show the process happening as you drive. The 4x4 mechanical package comes complete with an increase in ride height from the very modest 162mm you get on standard models to the slightly more capable 179mm that'll make terrain like that you'll find in a slippery field a little more accessible. Fiat says that this, combined with a set of restyled front and rear bumpers, will make your 500X slightly better on steep slopes too. So you can set off up a slope as steep as 21.3 degrees, traverse its summit with a breakover angle of as much as 22.3 degrees, and then tackle a downward descent of as much as 30.1 degrees. We were quite impressed when Fiat told us all of this, or at least we were, before the marketers then rather spoiled the effect by going on to suggest that this capability would set the car up perfectly for tackling the most awkward multi-storey car parks. That tells you everything you need to know, really. On to engines. There are lots of different ones in the lineup, but a surprising emission from the range is the 105 brake horsepower twin air petrol unit, used to good effect in affordable versions of this car's 500L MPV stablemate, a car of similar size and weight. Instead, Fiat has, for some reason, chosen to equip entry level petrol powered 500X models with a far less efficient 110 brake horsepower 1.6E torque power plant that, despite its greater size, delivers virtually no more pulling power or performance. 62 miles an hour from rest occupies 11.5 seconds in this variant on the way to 112 miles an hour. To be honest, if you're a petrol person and have a bit of budget flexibility, a much better choice is the more modern 140 brake horsepower 1.4 litre multi-air engine, which can improve those figures to 9.8 seconds and 118 miles an hour, but which, more significantly, improves pulling power by around 60%, from just 152 newton meters to a much more satisfying 230 newton meters. And that's a level of torque substantial enough to alleviate the need to row the car along with a gear lever. The multi-air engine can also be ordered with the option of Fiat's super smooth 9-speed twin-clutch automatic transmission, a setup that comes non-negotiably included, complete with four-wheel drive, if you opt for your 500X 1.4 multi-air in Pokia 170 brake horsepower guys. Most 500X owners, though, are going to want a diesel, probably the unit we'd recommend. The 120 brake horsepower 1.6 litre multi-jet 2 engine, which combines efficiency with reasonable performance. The 62 miles an hour sprint dispatched in 10.5 seconds en route to 115 miles an hour. There's a decent slug of pulling power too, 320 newton metres of it, enough to allow a 1200 kilogram brake trailer to be towed, a task that you couldn't even consider were you to opt for the lineup's feebler 95 brake horsepower 1.3 litre multi-jet diesel variant. Like all lower powered 500X models, that 1.3 can only tow up to 800 kilos. Pulling power though is in plentiful supply in the variant I'm driving here, the top 140 brake horsepower 2 litre multi-jet diesel. And thanks to this variant standard four-wheel drive system, it's an ideal choice if you've the occasional need to lug a small caravan or a trailer about. If I was going to stretch to two litre multi-jet motoring, then I'd certainly want to consider the automatic transmission option that I'm trying here. It's an interesting gearbox with no fewer than 20 different change mappings, thanks to the fact that this is the first nine speed automatic in this sector. You heard that right, it has nine speeds. 
do you really need that many ratios in a relatively modestly performing car that gets to 62 miles an hour in 9.8 seconds en route to 180 miles an hour? Probably not. Still, when the shift quality is as good as it is with this ZF gearbox, you'd have no issues if Fiat had put 20 ratios into it. Leave it in auto and this electronically controlled transmission will plug you into the meat of the torque with each change whilst optimising economy. Refinements optimised too, at least by the standards of the most recent Fiat diesels that we remember. For some reason, this 500X is far quieter than an equivalent multi-jet diesel driven 500L model. The X feels a lot firmer too, something emphasised by these unyielding seats. It's true that the ride never gets what you call harsh, but you certainly feel up close and personal on the road surface on a typical bumpy back road. Make sure that you can live with that. And if you can, don't be tempted to worsen things by fitting larger 18-inch alloy wheels. You will also need to make allowances for the rather vague steering. Yes, you can weight it up by switching into the drive mood selector sport mode, but in this case, extra weight doesn't equal extra feel. But we're prepared to forgive that though, in view of the fact that body roll is so well controlled, even through the tightest bends. Another area in which the 500X is vastly superior to its 500L stablemate. You could even have fun at the wheel of this car, which is, after all, part of the point of owning a small crossover. There aren't too many small crossovers with Stylium. It gets an almost universal vote of confidence, but we really haven't chanced upon anyone who doesn't like the 500X. Designed in-house by Fiat's Centro Stile Studio, this model not only has clear links to its siblings and the current 500 family, but also to the iconic 1957 original. Most notably when it comes to these large circular headlamps, the bright work on the nose, and this distinctive clamshell bonnet. Cross and Cross Plus models like this one get the full urban SUV look with extra plastic cladding, roof rails and chunkier bumpers with skid plates front and rear. In short, all the calling cars you'd expect to find from a vehicle of the Duke genre. Strip away the tinsel by opting for one of the lower trim levels and you'll be left with a car that really doesn't look very crossover at all. That recipe instead merely delivering buyers a more spacious, versatile Fiat 500. Nothing more and nothing less. Still, an awful lot of people seem to be looking for exactly that. Something this 500X delivers with the style and assurance that its 500L MPV stablemate so notably failed to provide. That model's flatter window line and roof profile robbed it of the cute, curvy profile that so endeared buyers to the 500 and its three-door city car guys. Here, though, both these things are present and correct, and the result is a shape that many will love. It's also a shape that's a good deal bigger than it looks. The curvy styling disguising dimensions that make this 500X one of the largest small crossover models you can buy. It's over 100 millimetres longer than cars like Nissan's Duke, Renault's Capture and the Mini Countryman. That may be partly because this model has also to provide the underpinnings for Jeep's Renegade, a compact crossover that sells for a significantly higher price and hopes to tempt buyers who might also be considering bigger mid-sized crossovers like Nissan's Qashqai and Renault's Kadjo. Both Renegade and 500X rolled down the same FCA production line at Fiat's Italian Melfi plant near Potenza. We think that the rear section of the car works particularly well with its large, characterful light clusters, its restrained bright work and its sloping roof line. It's the part of the car that just looks wrong on a 500L, though to be fair, that car's boxiness is necessary to satisfy its compact MPV status. Freed from that expectation, this model can properly mimic the curviness of its original city stablemate, though buyers will need to be aware that this approach exacts a practical penalty. Raise the tailgate and you'll discover a 350 litre boot capacity. That's 50 litres less than you get with a 500L and is even further behind squarer, small crossovers like Mini's Countryman and the Renault Capture. 
Still, this cargo area is a match in size for rivals like Nissan's Duke and Peugeot's 2008 and can be quite flexible too if you opt for the extra cost luggage compartment organiser and the adjustable height and reversible boot floor. We've got that letter feature here but it's not a lot of use because the space it would normally slot into below is in this case occupied by an optional full-size spare wheel. Push forward the split folding 6040 rear bench and a thousand litres of fresh air will be freed up thanks to seat backs that fold almost completely flat. There's more room available too if you tick the box for the optional fold flat front passenger seat. Seat yourself at the wheel and it doesn't initially feel very Fiat 500. What's delivered here is as different from that little city car as you expect it would be, this being a larger and more expensive design. It's slightly more of a surprise, though, to find how different the cabin is from that 500L five-door model I was just talking about. The stylists started again from scratch here, as they did with the exterior looks, and the interior is all the better for it. So nearly all the switch gear and instrumentation is specific to the 500X. These chunky circular ventilation dials that sit above the SD card and USB connectivity slots look particularly smart. And there's a higher standard of build quality than we've ever previously experienced in any kind of Fiat. Some semblance of familiarity is maintained by a smattering of 500 model line design cues. Things like the quirky metal door handles, the hard round head restraints, the boiled sweet like buttons and the pull ball style gear knob that you get on manual gearbox variants. This model branded body coloured plastic dashboard facing is a familiar touch too. Although the enamelled surface that you get on cheaper versions is preferable to the sandpaper style finish applied to plusher models like this. This panel surrounds what is arguably the cabin's most eye-catching feature, the 5-inch Uconnect infotainment touchscreen fitted to all but entry-level versions and expanded to 6.5 inches in size on top variants like this one. As with most systems of this kind, the Uconnect setup deals with stereo and informational functions, as well as the optional TomTom SatNav system, and on the move allows you to keep up to date with Facebook and Twitter while giving traffic updates, speed camera alerts, weather information and news alerts from Reuters, along with a range of other downloadable apps. For example, you might want to select from millions of music tracks on Deezer or choose from more than 100,000 radio stations with TuneIn. You activate all this functionality either via the touchscreen or by voice commands or by getting to grips with the many and initially slightly confusing buttons on the chunky three-spoke steering wheel. Through this, you view three circular individually cowled dials with a speedometer unfortunately only marked in 20 miles per hour increments, and a rev counter flanking a large central configurable 3.5-inch TFT display, which can be set to provide everything from a digital speed readout to safety system and stereo information. It also informs you of your chosen setting from the rotary drive mood selector dial provided on all but entry-level models to tweak throttle, steering and gear shift patterns to suit the way you want to drive. You're positioned commandingly in front of all this by a high set and rather firmly sprung seat, complete with embossed 500 branding, though this does place you 45 millimetres lower than you would be in a comparable Jeep Renegade. Elbow comfort is aided by an adjustable armrest and wide door panel edges. And we like the way that these central cup holders are positioned so that the cans and bottles they'll house won't get in the way. Plus, there's decent in-cabin storage for other small items too, with wide door bins, the option of a storage compartment in the central armrest, and a good-sized glove box with neat upper and lower segments. Build quality also seems strong, and if your budget permits, you can create a very personal and even quite exclusive feel with a careful choice from the huge range of fabric, leather and trim panel colour configurations possible. It's even possible to get a map of this car's Melfi factory production facility printed on the floor mats. I'm not really sure why you'd want that. Anyway, time to take a seat in the rear. This is where you appreciate this model's slightly above average class length, which means that taller backseat folk don't have to duck down on entry to get their heads around that curving roofline. 
Once inside, there's reasonable room for three. Certainly, there's more space than there would be in the back of a Nissan Duke or Renault Capture. Yes, it is a bit dark in here if you opt for a more restrained trim like I have on this model, but you could improve things immeasurably in that respect by opting for a sky dome glass sunroof that fills the cabin with light. As usual in this class of car, room for your knees and legs is at a bit of a premium, pitched somewhere between the space you get in a Fiesta-sized Super Mini and a Focus-sized family hatch, but it's fine by segment standards. As you may be aware, Fiat has already brought us a larger-bodied five-door 500 model, Badgley 500L. This 500X adds to that car's versatility with crossover looks and extra technology, so you'd expect it to cost slightly more. And sure enough, go for a top version like the one I've been trying here, and it will do. Further down the lineup, though, Fiat's marketeers had two issues. First, they had to undercut the pricing of this car's Jeep Renegade design stable date to stop potential buyers defecting to what might be seen to be Jeep's more premium badge. And second, they had to price entry-level 500X variants low enough to be able to target the relatively affordable 14 to 16,000 pound bracket, where segment headliners like Nissan's Duke and Renault's Capture have been doing so well. And that meant undercutting comparable 500L models, actually by quite a lot. So it is that while a Fiat 500L with a bit of lifestyle trim could easily cost you 19 to 20,000 or more, this 500X, which of course features lifestyle looks from the get-go, was launched with pricing starting from under 15,000. To some extent, that's a little misleading, for to qualify for such a price tag, you're saddled with the basic pop level of trim that lacks two of the features that really make this car what it is. The drive mood selector that allows you to tweak engine response, steering feel and stability control intervention to suit the way you want to drive. And the Uconnect infotainment system with its Bluetooth connectivity and multimedia applications. Plus, as you might expect at range entry level, you've got to have the least powerful petrol engine. In this case, a 1.6 litre e-torque 110 brake horsepower unit. If that's the kind of 500X variant that you're looking at, you'll certainly need to be sticking to your guns in the showroom, as your Fiat salesperson there will have plenty of reasons for suggesting that you should spend more. The key two equipment items that I just mentioned are both included if you find an extra premium of just over £1,700 to graduate to pop star trim, the next level up in the range. You'll also, of course, need to find more if you need the diesel power plant that the majority of buyers will want. There is a diesel option at base pop level, but it's Fiat's feeble 95 brake horsepower 1.3 litre multi-jet unit, an engine not really suited to lugging around 1.3 tonnes of 500X. So ideally, as a typical buyer of this car, you'll really need the brand's 120 brake horsepower 1.6 litre multi-jet unit, which, with that pop star trim, needs a £19,000 budget, all of which brings us roughly back to where we started the kind of money Fiat thinks that a properly specified version of this car should be worth. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, you can easily spend a lot more than that. Those looking at the pop star trim I've been talking about and wanting to give this car the modicum of all-weather ability its chunky looks promise can opt to find £1,000 more for the cross-spec level that adds a traction function to that drive mood selector I mentioned earlier. This sat up there to ease you over slippery surfaces. Or they could find £2,800 more over the pop star trim and move up to the plusher Cross Plus spec that I have here with its larger wheels and greater cargo area flexibility. It's certainly true that at the Cross and Cross Plus levels, you give yourself more buying options. Diesel buyers of these variants prepared to fund a £2,000 premium over the cost of 1.6 litre multi-jet power can get themselves into what I think is the premium 500X package, one that combines the pokiest 140 brake horsepower 2 litre multi-jet diesel engine with four-wheel drive. That's the setup Fiat has given us to try, and it's one that comes with the option of a sophisticated nine-speed automatic gearbox, though by that point you'll find yourself looking at a £26,000 car, which is essentially what I have here. 
If I'd included a few more options on this model, I could easily have got myself a £30,000 Fiat 500X, which takes a bit of mental adjustment. You see what I mean about how pricing can spiral with a car like this? Mind you, that's true with just about every other contender in this sector, primarily with this model's design stablemate, Jeep's Renegade, a car which shares just about everything with this Fiat under the skin, yet in most guises requires a model-for-model -model premium of around £2,000. 500X buyers could also find themselves making that kind of saving over other rival small crossovers like Mazda's CX-3, Honda's HRV, the Mini Countryman and the base petrol version of Vauxhall's Mocha. So far, so good. Most buyers, though, will be focusing on how this fit compares with the two segment leaders, Nissan's Duke and Renault's Capture. Again, it looks competitive. In base, 110 brake horsepower, 1.6 litre petrol form, a 500X doesn't cost much more than a far feebler 90 brake horsepower capture. And it'll save you around £700 over the most directly comparable 1.2 litre DIGT Nissan Duke. As for diesel power, well, it is true that a baseline 1.3 litre Multijet 500X is a few hundred pounds more expensive than its Duke and Capture counterparts. But remember, you can have the Fiat with the kind of drive mood selector system those two rivals don't offer. And this makes it better suited to the kind of all-weather conditions crossovers are supposed to be suited for. Only one direct rival, Peugeot's comparably priced 2008, offers a drive mood style system. Peugeot called it grip control. But you can only get that on the car's most expensive trim levels. Are there other options you could consider in this segment? A few. If you're looking at one of the less powerful 500X models, then you could also consider cars like Ford's EcoSport, uh, Citroen C4 Cactus, uh, Kia's Soul and Suzuka's Vitara and SX4 S-Cross models. All of them are comparably priced, but none can deliver the handling, the refinement and arguably the street cred of this Fiat. Skoda's Yeti, the only other car in this class to offer an engine as large as two litres in size, also struggles with this and is more expensive in its lower range geysers. Otherwise, there aren't too many choices in this class unless you want to save some money but put up with the patchy build quality and uncertain residual values of bargain brand models like Dacia's Duster and Sangyong's Tivoli. If, having considered all of this, you conclude that it is a 500X that you really want, then you're going to need to know just how generous Fiat has been with the standard spec. As I've already mentioned, the entry-level pop trim lacks a few key items, but to be fair, it does give you quite a smart look, courtesy of body-coloured bumpers, chrome-effect brightwork and gloss silver hubcaps. That's carried forward inside too, thanks to the interior's body colour dashboard panel. Plus, the cabin also gets air conditioning, a height-adjustable driver's seat, cruise control and all-round power windows. It's worth it, though, to find the extra money to graduate up to that pop star trim level, the one that earlier on I was suggesting you might want to target. As I've said, it's only from this point on in the range that you get that drive mood selector system and the Uconnect infotainment setup, both features included as part of a spec package that also runs to 17-inch alloy wheels, body-coloured mirrors, front fog lamps that turn with the corners, climate control and rear parking sensors. Perhaps more importantly, it's only from pop star level that 500X buyers start to get the widest range of choices. So you'll need to buy in at this level to get the more desirable budget engines, the 1.6 litre multi-jet diesel we'd recommend, or a 140 brake horsepower 1.4 litre multi-air petrol unit that also gives you the option of DDCT automatic transmission. It's worth mentioning too that Popstar trim is the lowest level in the lineup from which you can specify the range of option packs that you'll really want to consider in purchasing this car. Maybe the electric pack that gives you floor mats, powered front seats and an extra rear headrest. Perhaps the winter pack with the heated elements this provides in the steering wheel and in the front seats and in the windscreen. Or the comfort packs that give you things like an electrochromatic rear-view mirror, auto headlamps and wipers, and power-folding door mirrors. 
If you haven't stretched to the really plush trim level like the one I have here, you might also want to look at one of the Navi packs that upgrade you to a more sophisticated Uconnect infotainment system with a larger 6.5 inch colour touchscreen. If you've got yourself an SUV styled 500X, in other words, one of the Cross or Cross Plus trimmed models, a car like the one I've got here, then the situation's simpler, as many of the features I've just mentioned will be included as standard. The specific wheels, the unique front and rear bumpers, dark tinted rear windows and the roof rails you get with these variants really make them stand out. Something you can build further upon if you opt for the lovely tri-coat paint finish that I have here in magnetic bronze. Otherwise, it'll be a question of carefully perusing the options list and looking at things like the full length sky dome glass sunroof the luggage compartment organiser, or maybe one of the leisure extra packs that include a reversible boot mat and can give you racks for things like bikes and skis. My favourite optional item, though, is the thumping Beats audio sound system, which is developed in collaboration with the experts from Beats by Dr Dre. This eight-speaker premium hi-fi setup gives you a 560-watt eight-channel digital amplifier and a 15-litre subwoofer that sits in the cargo bay and near recording studio sound quality. You'll want the look of your 500X to be personal too. The alloy wheel rims can be coordinated in a colour match theme that you might also want to extend inside as you select from a range of classy seat facings. Inevitably, there are colour coordinated options for the bodywork too, with extra packs themed in red, white, bronze, beige, black, or chrome. You can even colour coordinate your car's key fob if you want to. On to safety. As you'd expect in this day and age, twin front side and curtain airbags are standard across the range, along with a series of electronic features designed to ensure that you never have an accident in the first place. There's ABS braking and ESC stability control, of course, plus ASR traction control and a dynamic steering torque system to give the car a bit more cornering bite. You also get MSR gear shift engine torque management, so the car won't skid if you select too low a gear on a slippery surface. Plus there's ERM, electronic rollover mitigation, hill start assist to stop you drifting backwards on uphill junctions, a TPMS, tyre pressure monitoring system, and on most models, a neat automatic windscreen demisting feature. As a buyer, I'd also want to consider adaptive cruise control that automatically keeps you a safe distance behind the car in front on the highway. And maybe also the optional safety pack, which includes four key features. There's a rear view camera, a blind spot assist feature to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake in front of another driver, and a lane departure warning setup that stops dozy drivers from veering out of their lanes on the highway. The most interesting inclusion, perhaps, though, is Fiat's clever brake control system. This scans the road ahead for accident hazards as you drive at speeds of between 4 miles an hour and 120 miles an hour. If one is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond, or you aren't able to, then the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Cleverly, the sensitivity of the system's braking threshold can be adjusted to the driver's preferences. In terms of the combination you'll probably need of efficiency and all-round performance, there's a clear sweet spot in the 500X lineup, and it lies with the 120 brake horsepower, 1.6 litre multi-jet 2 diesel variant. Here's a unit that's just as clean as the much feebler 95 brake horsepower, 1.3 litre multi-jet diesel, delivering 109 grams per kilometre of CO2. Yet, it can easily enable you to tow, take you to 62 miles an hour in around 10 seconds, and waft you about on an easy wave of torque. You can expect very good economy too, 68.9 miles per gallon on the combined cycle. Overall, those returns aren't quite as good as those you get from direct rivals like Renault's Capture DC110 or Peugeot's 2008 1.6 Blue HDI 120. They're very close to the figures you could manage at the wheel of a feebler Nissan Duke DCI 110. And for most Fiat fans, that'll be good enough.
Inevitably, this bigger diesel can't get near the fuel returns of the 1.6 litre derivative I was just talking about, but it does manage 51.4 miles per gallon on the combined cycle. In other words, if you go for the 2 litre multi jet, you can get four wheel drive, automatic transmission, and a 0 to 62 miles per hour time of under 10 seconds in your 500X, yet still slightly better the running cost returns of a direct petrol alternative that would only give you two wheels drive and a manual gearbox namely the 1.4 litre multi-air 140 brake horsepower model. Now that sounds reasonable. This petrol variant incidentally manages 139 grams per kilometre of CO2 and 47.1 miles per gallon on the combined cycle. Earlier on in this film, I was talking about Fiat's decision not to use its modern two-cylinder twin-air 105 brake horsepower petrol engine as the entry-level petrol power plant in this car. That is, after all, an engine that seems to very well suit the brand's other five-door 500 model, the 500L, a car of similar size and weight that uses this unit to record a CO2 figure of 112 grams per kilometre and a combined cycle fuel return of nearly 60 miles per gallon. In contrast, the older, less efficient entry-level petrol power plant that this 500X does use, a 1.6 litre e-torque 110 brake horsepower unit hobbled by the fact that unlike other derivatives in the range, it has no engine stop-start system, manages only 147 grams per kilometre and 44.1 miles per gallon on the combined cycle. That's quite a difference. Of course, the ultimate figures you achieve will depend very much on how you drive something that can be aided by the Fiat EcoDrive system. In its original form, this setup worked via a USB stick that you stuck into a socket in the car, then took out again and downloaded onto your PC when you got home. The resulting data offering feedback on the efficiency of your driving that was accompanied with tips on how to improve it. This rather nerdy setup has now been replaced with a mobile app that delivers the same information in real time via a compatible smartphone. What else? Uh, well, there's a three year unlimited mileage warranty, which is slightly better than the class norm. As for residual values, well, Fiat will be hoping this car conforms to the strong pattern established by the three door 500 model here, rather than that of the bigger 500L. If it does, then 500X ownership will deliver owners more of a return on their investment than they'd get from mainstream rivals like the Nissan Duke and the Renault Capture competitors I mentioned earlier. That is assuming that Fiat buyers don't go too mad on the options list. Maintenance costs should be as affordable as they usually are for Fiat models. And you can organize servicing visits more easily by taking advantage of the My Car Service feature that's been built into the Uconnect Live aspect of this car's infotainment system. This gives you an interactive vehicle handbook and real-time servicing reminders that can be set to work with a Uconnect Live account that you can set up on your smartphone. Finally, uh, insurance give you an idea here you'll be looking at a rating of between groups 11 and 12 for a 1.4 litre multi-air 140 brake horsepower petrol model a rating of between 13 and 14 for a 1.6 litre multi-jet diesel and a rating of group 15 for this top 2 litre multi-jet diesel 4x4 auto variant So this 500X draws upon the heritage and history of Fiat's 500 model line, it doesn't depend on it in the way that previous spin-off models have done. Even if you had no idea what the original 500 was, you'd enjoy this car. It looks good, it drives well, it's decently equipped and it comes with a pretty efficient set of running costs and is anything but boring. Of course, these attributes are hardly unique in the Duke and Capture dominated small crossover sector. What is unusual in this segment is to have combined these virtues with an authentic sense of retro style that comes with a modern twist. Like Fiat's 500 City Car, but unlike the brand's 500L MPV, this model's greatest selling point lies in the way it looks. So, as expected, there's style here and, rather surprisingly, substance too, thanks to a development need to accommodate the mechanicals of this car's design stablemate, Jeep's Renegade. Most rivals in this segment struggle to offer their owners any extra capability at all when conditions turn nasty. 
In contrast, this Fiat's Drive Mood Selector System will deliver a crucial dose of extra prowess when you need it most. Plus, there's a wider range of full four-wheel drive variants than you'd expect in this segment. Combine all of this with clever connectivity, practical versatility and the prospect of fashionable personalisation and you can see why Fiat's hopes are high for this car. Yes, prices get ambitious as you ascend the range, but at least the sticker figures are backed up by a quality of design and build missing from the brand until quite recently. The result is one of the most competitive models this Italian manufacturer has brought us for years and a contender you just can't ignore if you're charmed by the Duke genre. It has the X Factor.